Welcome to Wisco Dice. Hey, yo, folks, I'm your host, Conzi with the most, and I am here today with... Hey, it's Justin, the Meeple's champion. I'm Matt, Ghost Walker. And I'm Suzanne. And this is episode 120 of the Wisco Dice Tabletop Gaming Podcast. Today is February 28th, 2024, and on today's episode... We're going to explore the pros and cons of different gaming environments. So, Matt, why don't you go ahead and let us know a little bit about what these different gaming environments are. Like, what what do we mean? Sure. So, we obviously are here and listening. We all love to game. But what about different locations? Have you ever gamed outside your own home or at a friend's home? What about at a convention? Have you gone to a board game cafe? Maybe you go on a nice vacation and you take your board games with you. What we'd like to pursue today is give you our perspective on the benefits and negatives, maybe of some of the more popular venues you might be gaming at. Why don't we go ahead and click kick this right off with a question for all of our hosts. And for you, those of you listening along at home or wherever you happen to be listening to this show, why don't, you let, why don't you post on our social media and let us know what your answer is to this following question, which is, where is your favorite place to play games and why? And let's start with Suzanne. Well, I like playing games just about anywhere, anytime. So, I mean, when I say my favorite, it's probably the place I am the most comfortable in, which would be my house, if I had to pick a favorite. It's... It's that way because I can wear the clothes I want. I can take care of the dog. I don't be worried about getting back to let the dog out. Food I want is there. If I need to take a break, I can do that too. Uh, So for me, it's uh, a little bit about just fitting the gaming into my daily life. And that's easiest to do at my house. So that would be my favorite place. But uh, Matt, where do you enjoy gaming? I, for a long time, have been going over to others' houses. I mean, I've blessed going to your guys' house and others uh, to game. But frankly, we did just build a brand new gaming space, so I reserve the right to change my opinion in the near future. (laughs) Justin, what about you? I'm kind of 50-50 between gaming at my house and gaming at friends' houses. I'm pretty lucky to have several friends who have very nice gaming spaces and we'll say significant game collections. And and that's where I probably do most of my gaming as at friends houses. So obviously I really appreciate being able to play at a very nice, high quality gaming table. And, you know, I definitely enjoy sort of seeing what new games are in the collections of my friends and stuff like that. But I also like the, it, it, the space I have at my house. It's a little smaller, a little more intimate. So I have sort of a smaller group of people to come play and i i do also like that sort of smaller intimate maybe just a four-player game at most kind of a setting as well so i'm I'm kind of between those two ben how about you well as much as i love having people over to our house to play games i'm gonna say that i think my favorite place to play is at cons there's a couple of big reasons for that i mean i certainly i think one of the things that gets me most excited is getting a chance to meet uh, all of the new people and, and that I get to meet through conventions and have these great new connections and, and great opportunities to share games that I'm really passionate about with them. But, of course, there's always those opportunities to bump into people that have listened to the show or seen our YouTube channel. By the way, we have a YouTube channel. You can hop over there to subscribe today. And uh, it that part is just awesome. And I, I really do love love that piece of where I like to play. So I think conventions are really starting to turn into one of my favorite places to play. But our house and gaming at your home is usually one of the places that a lot of people start at. And there's a lot of pros and cons to just gaming at your house. I mean, certainly if we're buying games, it gives you the best chance to get the games that you own to the table. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my number one reason for why I'm going to have people over because sometimes you can bring a game to somebody else's house 
but I would say most of the time I'm gaming somewhere else, the host has something in mind that they want to play or a couple things that, that get set up to be played. So that, yeah, for me, that's just like, if uh, there's a specific game I know I want to play, like pretty much going to have to host it at my place. <laughs> Well, and it also gives you an opportunity when you when you're having to break those games out of the cellophane. You know, you, yes. you want to get it on the table, right, and play it with somebody. The nice thing is you also have control of the space to an extent. I mean, we all have different budgets, just like board gaming, right? Not everybody's going to go buy four hundred dollars worth of something every day. But <laughs> if you have a space, whether it be like you said, yours is a little bit more small and intimate, or others that have bigger spaces. You do get a little bit of control over that space. So if you've spent some time and energy in making it nicer, you get an opportunity to have people over and show it off a little bit you know, or just give them a nice place to play. But you can do it within whatever budget you have. Yeah. I, you, you do get stuck with the cleanup, though, after they've all been over. That That is true. <laughs> I mean, some people will definitely, at least in our group, we always offer to try to help you uh, clean up the game. But... We also, sometimes when you're holding a game, you might not be doing it just for a, a simple night. Sometimes, like I know amongst all of us, we occasionally like to host a longer session at our, our houses. So it might be we start at noon and go till whenever. In those situations, I'm probably hosting and bringing some food and other people might bring food along too. And when they leave, somebody's got to deal with all that leftover food or plates or things like that. Yeah. And then along with the, the cleanup, when you're hosting, you need to have a selection of games that you know well enough to teach, I feel, that you can say, hey, here's a game. Not only do I want to play, but I know how to play. So if anyone else knows how to play it, you're not stuck there for an hour, you know, passing a rule book around. But it's also like fun. It's kind of a pro too to like hey it's forcing you to really learn the games that are in your collection too which i which i do enjoy and it's always nice to be able to have the the control that you get at your own yeah. house yeah well you know and another thing for those of us with kids and this might be two-sided uh you know if i'm having games in my house i don't got to worry about dealing with the kids they can be at home i can kind of, you know, watch them as I need to while still getting some gaming in. But on the flip side, that could be a distraction for other people, the kids running around making noise or something like that. There's always that side of it. I mean, if your spouse isn't into games, you know, the whole other thing you got to deal with if you're having people over all the time, like, what are they doing? You're kind of pushing them off to watch the kids maybe, but yeah. Um, well, right. and I think the other advantage of having it at your home is if you have a specific game in mind or a type of game that you're interested in playing, you can potentially control who's coming over. Now that might sound a little one-sided, but we all have preferences and some people love party games, but do not dig a deep Euro that might take them four hours to go through. So if you know your interest is playing a deep Euro, you might, call the list of people that you know and you call to say, hey, I'm going to call the people that I know are going to enjoy this longer, beefier game. Or if all I'm doing is party games today, because that's what we feel like doing. If I have the person who's like, all I play is deep Euros, then they might not have a good time. So not to say you can't throw it out there for them, but. We have a couple of people that we know that we usually that we still invite them, but we know they're probably not going to show up if we're playing cooperative games, and that's just fine, you know. But we still like a lot of times we'll still invite them unless we're trying to specifically get just that one game to the table. It's just it's nice to have, like you said, to have that control over. Hey, I want to play this game, and I want to play it with people that understand and enjoy this type of game, especially if you're all learning it for the first time. So that it's not, you know, necessarily being exclusionary. It's just you you have some games you play with certain people and some with others, just like you go to baseball games with only those friends that enjoy baseball. And you leave kind of don't invite the ones that hate it. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all of us are fortunate that are on the show today to that we have our own 
in-home gaming spaces and space to have a gaming space that's dedicated in our home in our in our homes but not everybody even has the physical space you know let's say if you're in like a tiny new york apartment that's all of like 200 square feet or whatever or something like that you might just not have the space or be comfortable with having people over to your house so there are other options one of those options is just like you know how do you afford more board games well one of our key re- key w- key ways to afford more board games is to have friends buy the games for you so you don't have to buy them yourself <laughs> and play their collection and you don't have to store them so you don't have to spend the money on the storage unit to store those but games too also if your friends have the games they may have gaming space at their house which means now you can you know if you don't have the space at your house you can go play at theirs and there's some really good advantages to doing that. Of course, leaving your mess there is not, you know, we it definitely encourage you to pick up after yourself and be a good guest at somebody's house. But hey, you don't have to, you know, hopefully, you know, you can leave, you know, put your trash in the trash bins. And if somebody at the, it gets late at night, at least, a, you know, when we host a game, it gets late, late at night here. We let people go. They don't have to help pick up the game or anything. Get get going home. It's late. It's a work night or whatever. You know, and a lot of times somebody hosting that, if it's your friend's house, they'll let you do that. Yeah. They're they're cool like that and let you get out of there. But there's a, lot, a number of other awesome reasons to game at a friend's house. I think for me, it's always because it does expose me to games that I don't have. Now, my wife and I have started a gaming collection and, and we are growing it. And I don't think it'll ever be as large as, say, uh, Ben and Suzanne's, which is substantial and might be the biggest of the ones I know. But we also have another uh, set of friends who live on the far side of town who ha- also have a gigantic collection of games. <laughs> uh, but for me, it, it it exposes me to other games that I, I might not pick up in my own house. Or maybe, you know, I have three kids, so until recently, which is when we started really doing board games heavily in the last, I would say, five years, my kids were younger and I didn't have the money all the time to invest in board games. And now that I am, you know, a solid, what, 10, 15 years behind Ben and Suzanne on collecting. So I've got a few years of catch up to do. But that's the thing I enjoy is you guys have so many broad interests in games. I get exposed to all sorts of different things. And, you know, when Justin comes over, Justin brings something totally different, something that maybe isn't in your collection. And I like that I get exposed to other games that then I might want to add to my collection. So that's one of the things I really enjoy about going to somebody else's house is they have different interests, different things they've been exposed to. And I get to see their games and really try before I buy if I want to. Yeah, which those are all really positive. And that's one of the things I definitely enjoy, like especially when we go play at Justin's house is that he has so many games that I was really curious about, but maybe weren't, Ben wasn't super excited about. So we didn't buy them and we're like, well, Justin has it. So we'll get a play in at some point. And like with just the different interests that friends have that are very, you know, specific, like they really like this type of game. They'll focus on collecting that where Ben and I, yes, we kind of just have a, a wide gamut of it, of types of games. and. So that's what we enjoy, just trying out all these different ones. I will say one of the one of the downsides that I need to be careful of when I play at a friend's house is just what pets they have, because I do have some severe pet allergies, so I have to limit my time and kind of prep for for going. So it does not stop me from going. It just maybe limits the time that I'm able to spend at a friend's house with with gaming. So. Uh, that's rough yeah yeah it's yeah you make do and you always bring your chauffeur with you so that if you can't breathe when you leave they can drive you <laughs> well and like anything if you're going to go to somebody else's house no they might not be close too so if they live a solid hour away you know it's not like that's necessarily going to stop us but it might limit the times that we do it as well because going over for a game that's going to take an hour and a half if I've got to drive an hour. I'm going to spend more time in the car than I am playing the game. So, Yeah, I wish my friends didn't stop moving further away. <laughs> it seems like most of my, 
some of my oh. Ben and then another friend of ours moved like way further away. So it's like a half hour drive now for <clears throat> to get to either one of you guys. But I'm I'll do it. I'm we had to escape city taxes. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. well, no, I'm on other things. So yeah. Yeah, I guess that was the first move was uh the taxes. So So yeah. but there's there's certainly the pros it's it is really nice to be able to just get out of the house and have an excuse to get out of the house and to go socialize with others and uh because somebody else is responsible typically when you're playing at a friend's house for managing the organization, you don't have the stress or worrying about who to invite or what time it's going to be. They're going to provide all of those details so that you can just focus on, hey, I show up, maybe I bring a game or two of my own collection, or maybe we're playing a game that we know because we all agreed to it ahead of time, or whatever the case might be. You get there, you, you play, the, you're, and you're able to just get right into playing and focus on, on the gaming piece of it without any of the hassle of organizing yourself. Of course... Sometimes, and it's happened to us a couple of times, you know, you show up at somebody's house and besides pets, who knows what the what the distractions are going to be there or mm-hmm. or the level of cleanliness or who knows what. If you've, you know, I've, I've been to a couple of places where, yeah, I'm not sure I will really want to go back there again. And maybe that... That's that's not necessarily a positive in your book because if the place is you know overtly filthy or there's a dozen cats running around or not that I don't like cats but a dozen of them may be a little extreme in a, a twelve hundred foot space or something. Well, and it can and, even be something like noise or like for me, there's sometimes I'll be gaming with people who like to just have music going the entire time, like fairly loud music and like especially when I'm trying to learn a game, having music on in the background just breaks my brain. Like I cannot concentrate on listening to rules when there's like thumping electronic music going on or just honestly any kind of loud music. And like, I don't, just for me, I kind of prefer generally playing in a, a, playing a game when there's not music going on. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's always that chance that that's just how they like, how do they like to do it at their house? You know? Well, they're just trying to take... cover up some other noises they're making. <laughs> <laughs> but you take noisy into consideration. Our next location, conventions and board game cons <laughs> in particular, can be really noisy because of all of the people that are there. But yeah. what you do get is a dedicated time of day, a day or maybe multiple days of, you know what, just gaming and being surrounded by games and people that are there to do nothing better than to play games and hang out and do games and game, 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 and more game. And that's awesome. One thing I've never experienced at a convention, and, you know, I've had some people that maybe are a little grumpy, but no one's been just unhappy to be there. And, you know, putting a whole damper on the whole convention. So it's always these people that it's gaming all over the place and excitement about gaming, which you don't always see and get exposed to. And you just kind of your energy feeds off that. And I could, you know, I can go forever sometimes with those gaming conventions. So that's, you know, so that's always nice to be able to have that energy. Yeah. And there's so many things to get energetic about, too. I I mean, I always enjoy the fact that you get exposure to games, but you can kind of be selective about it too. So if there were things that maybe I Googled or I saw on Kickstarter or whatever, and I was like, it looks good, but I just don't know. Well, if I plan ahead, I can sign up and participate in a game. And it doesn't have to be a new game. I mean, I mentioned Kickstarter in that, but it might have been, I've heard of this game and somebody was telling me about it. Well, somebody might be running that game there and I can participate in it and get a chance to actually kick the tires on the game before I add it to my collection. Or maybe it's a game that I really enjoy playing, but I only get to play it once or twice a year. And here's one of my opportunities to do it. You know, it, it's gotta be the single most expensive way to play board games though. I mean, you've (laughs) got your badge, your pat, you know, badge to get in the thing you got travel food lodging maybe um, parking 
parking. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times you're going to be paying for a game, even if it's just a small amount. So there's that, that consideration, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the, the costs definitely do add up when you look at it that way. I just keep going to myself. Well, if I was going out to a really nice restaurant and a movie, you know, four times, then it ends up kind of being the same. But yes, it feels very, it hurts your pocketbook when you're looking at it and everything. Another thing that I keep experiencing at uh, conventions is that I usually, that I sign up for games, I usually have one GM that doesn't show. So there I've like paid the money to get the tickets or spent the time to book this game I really want to try and then it, the GM doesn't show or enough players don't show up. But on the positive with that, every time the GM hasn't shown up, I've had the best time talking with the other players that were sitting there. Just had a blast talking to them about games, about where they're from, about, you know, their experiences. So um, inevitably one of them has yeah. a backup game in their in their bag too. So Yes, that is true. Yes. But yeah, it's just it's so great to just meet all these new people. I I will say uh it there yeah, we talk about cons being expensive and yes, there are a lot of expenses that go with conventions. But it depends on what con you're going to and and where the con is located and you know what its proximity is to you. Like if you're going to Gen Con, yes, you're even if you live in Indianapolis, you probably are going to end up spending a bunch of money between parking and food and all of the things, right? Because it's Gen Con, and that is that is just it is not an inexpensive convention. But at the same time, like uh, for us here in Madison, Wisconsin, we have Game Hole Con that's at the Alliant Energy Center, where the parking is free. Mm-hmm. Yes, you do have to pay up for a badge, but if I didn't want to pay for a badge, I could volunteer for the convention, or I could run X GM as uh, X a number of games during the convention, all to get reimbursement for that badge. There are a lot of ways you can mitigate some of those costs. So it is, you know, maybe we'll do that as a future topic to talk about. How you, how you can do conventions affordably without having to break the bank on that. Future yeah. YouTube topic, yeah. dear. There there we go. And that is something the first few years that I was going to conventions, it really wasn't in the budget for me. And so I did whatever I could to try and mitigate the costs and still be able to attend, attend and enjoy the convention fully. One thing to think about, too, that you, you can get with... Ex- conventions that you won't typically find at somebody's house is brand new games so games that are just coming out many of them release at conventions they are available at conventions sometimes many months before you can get them actually in a in your local favorite gaming store so that and you're there are a lot of opportunities depending on the convention where you can run into the actual developers of some of these games you know, some of these big names that you wouldn't think of. We've had some very big names. We live in Madison, Wisconsin, and GameholeCon, very big names that have showed up to GameholeCon, and, and somebody might go, well, I've never heard of GameholeCon. It doesn't matter. These developers and some of these uh, people, they love coming to these conventions. They love meeting people who are passionate about the same things that they are. So you kind of catch that fever, and you will meet them, and sometimes you can find out why they built the game the way they did. So it's just one of those things that you will not experience probably in your own home, unless you invite those developers over and they live near you. So, Of course, if you can't deal with the crowds or you can't deal with the expense or there's some other reason that's keeping you from checking out a game convention, there is always your local friendly gaming store. And um, for us all, we definitely want to tell you to promote and support your local game stores because it's what keeps local gaming really in the local gaming community running. It's probably going to be your best source for a wide variety of, of different games to add to your collection, to be able to shop at, to be able to explore and identify new games that are coming to market. It's one of the top places to do that. But most game stores have a dedicated base and or potential for 
uh, a gaming, uh, or they, they may even have a time slot on their schedule for when that gaming space is dedicated to, like, say, board gamers getting together. And those are great opportunities to have meetups, to meet other people in your area. Maybe you, maybe your friend group isn't as, as big as you'd like to be able to go play games with. It's a great opportunity to not only meet new local players, but also do so in a public, safe environment. Another nice thing that I notice, you know, a lot of these places have a fairly decent gaming library um, just sitting there for you to try out. So you can check out games before buying them, check out a library of stuff that you might not you might not have played before or stuff you haven't had exposure to. Yeah, I, I was like having that sort of, yeah, there's like a little pile of games I can go check out anytime I want. The other thing that I've found is, and, and understand, we host, as Wisco Dice, a board game night at one of our local gaming stores. There are a group of people that come there that aren't in our, I would call, our regular group that gets together. I mean, obviously, as Wisco Dice, we all kind of get together and flow uh, very regularly between our own houses. But the board game night is really nice because the people that show up there, one, they are it's so nice to meet them, but... They have totally different interests than us. They have, we have one gentleman that drives in from a uh, decent ways away, and he does it with us once a, a month. But he has some very unique interests in games that I don't think normally would have shown up in our friend group. But he's exposed them to us, and some of them have been a lot of fun. But I don't think we would have seen them on any one of our shelves normally. So that that's the nice thing is it's just like going to somebody else's house you're going to get exposed to games that you wouldn't have ordin ordinarily seen yes and going on with the people that come regularly to our monthly game night at misty mountain there are it's about 50 50 men and women coming to play the board games which i think for some people was a, is a shock at times because they are used to seeing the game stores filled uh, with men or with you know playing the other games and everything but once you get the board games in there the you know that dynamic changes a little bit and I so enjoy developing relationships with some of these people both men and women that are come and that we get to see you know month after month and it's expanded and encouraged my self-confidence with not only with some gaming but with other things, uh, like one of the women and I both are not great at posting on social media uh, for various reasons. So we have both we have kind of a joint resolution this year that we are going to keep working on posting that. And so it's like this little mini support group at times, too, uh, which I just think is great. So I look forward to, you know, catching up with everyone every month. So yeah. the one thing I have a hard thing time with is that I have no voice the next day because it does get really loud in there when it's completely full and you're you're kind of shouting instructions and everything. So that that's my yeah. main downside to the game stores. Yeah, I think that somewhat depends on what's going on. And some of the game stores, if it's a dedicated board game day, it may not be so bad. But like anything, even if you get three, four board games going at once, that many people talking all at once, it's going to get loud. Um, and they can be crowded. I mean, we always encourage you to support your gaming store, but not all game stores are created equal. Not all of them have um, an in-store great dedicated gaming space, but those that do might be good. Um, you know, obviously one of the other things to think about is depending on the gaming store, food and drink li options may be limited. Some don't want you to bring any in uh, just out of respect for other people and not spilling stuff. And some are very, you have to buy your stuff in store. So just kind of depends. There's some other little things too, you know, just considerations. I'm going to try to down talk down playing at a, at a game store, but you know, there are stores out there that do charge fees to use their gaming space. I think most of the ones here in town that I'm aware of don't charge fees, but I definitely know there's ones out there that do Obviously, the store is going to close at some point, so mm -hmm. you're going to get kicked out if you're playing a long game and it's taking too long. No, or even they just... should be twenty four seven. Just yeah, well, I agree, but one. you know, somebody somebody's got to staff the place. Bathroom facilities might not be the best. I think ultimately the pros probably outweigh these small cons. You know, for for gaming at a local gaming store, though. I, I was going to say 
one of the other things that I was exposed to in the last few years is a different type of venue is the concept of a board game cafe. Now, I'm not sure everybody understands the concept of a board game cafe, but for those of you that don't, the board game cafe is basically like a little cafe that is solely focused on board games. So they may sell some food, they may have some drinks, but usually for a, a nominal fee, it's not usually terrible. I, I, I frankly don't know what the one in town charges, but basically you can rent a table and for a period of time you can play however many games and they usually have a fairly substantial curated board game library where you can go check out a board game and go sit at a table and play uh, board games uh, i i was exposed to this by somebody in a totally different city than than madison and i thought it was just the coolest thing i'd ever run into it was just so neat to just have a... It's basically a space fully dedicated to board gaming from my perspective. Usually have def decent tables. It's usually got enough space between them. But then, you know, that that's one of the cooler spaces that I've been exposed to. Ben, what are your thoughts on board game cafes? I haven't spent a lot of time in board game cafes, but we do have the one here in town, uh, at least the one I know of in here in town. And... Um, it's associated with some regular gaming group get togethers as well. And I think the, the nice option there is that it's, you know, these places aren't just where they're different from the game store experiences that they're providing usually a cleaner, brighter space because there's, because they are serving food and drinks, uh, typically at these places. And the fact that it's easy to get food, like we're gamers we like to snack while we're playing games. Like that's just, I think that's a very common thing for most of us. And so, hey, I'm going to grab a thing of fries or a fancy uh, fountain soda, or maybe it's a, hey, I, I'm going to get a mocha coffee or whatever the case might be to be able to sit down at a location and, and play for a few hours uh, at a table that Hey, we're we're there for, and a lot of these th uh, places will have like local meetups and and whatnot, where there's there's also like really encouraged open like, hey, if you don't you know, even if you don't necessarily know anybody else, you can show up at this meetup and you'll be able to find people to to play games with. So it's a great opportunity to meet other players as well. I think a lot of those things make board game cafes potentially a draw for people who aren't as diehard gamers as well for newer gamers or people who might be intimidated by a traditional board game or game store so it's a it's another way for to get new people new blood into the hobby i think a little bit for example my daughter doesn't play like a ton of board games she's not like a big gamer or anything but her and her friend group arranged this trip to the board game cafe in town and they just had a blast like none of them are crazy super board gamers like us but it exposed them to to different games and to to the hobby so i think that's great well and if you live in a small apartment as we kind of mentioned earlier maybe you don't have a dedicated space this is another opportunity of a place where they have dedicated space you can go there and if you don't have space whether it be for tables or you just can't keep a large board game library well there you go you've got one that's kind of curated and gives you option to play something that isn't in your library. I like the idea of the board game cafe as a very social place to go and play games, sort of like a, a bar people look at as a social way. So it's a so like it's a social bar with games as a focus instead of alcohol or bands or whatever. So versus a game store where it's still a business, people are coming in to buy stuff. And that's their, you know, a lot of times that's more of their focus or people are very intent on their magic draft and everything. With the cafe, it just seems like it's a lot more relaxed and, hey, come in, check it out, leave, talk to people type of thing. So I'm, I think we actually have two or three board game cafes now in, in Madison and then a couple more in the surrounding areas. They kind of seem to pop up and then disappear before i have a chance to go check them out too much so i got it again next time i hear about one I, we need to go right away then 
There is that one that's that has been there for quite a while. I know of. I don't know about the other In ones. Garver. Yeah, Garver feed mill. Yeah. So, so that yeah. one, that one yeah. used to be downtown, and there is a, supposedly mm-hmm. another one downtown. Now. Well, I mean, um, I mean, obviously, <laughs> when you're dealing with a situation like this, too, things to bear in mind. If you're picking out a game that you none of you have played before, you will likely be teaching yourselves. It's not going to have somebody there necessarily that's going to know the game and going to come over and spend time with you teaching it. So that's something to bear in mind. And just like a friend, your friendly late local game store, you, there's going to be limited location time hours. So you've got to think about when they open, when they close, and coordinate around that. It's 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 not a horrible downside. Um, but when you also have this many people going in and out of the games, probably odds are high that one or two of the components may not have made it back into the box. But some of well, them keep and, tracking that. Well, and then you have the whole issue of, yes, there's food and drinks, but oh, no, there's food and drinks. Like, I'm I'm pretty particular about protecting my board games. <laughs> and uh, I get nervous when there's even just like water sitting on the game table that we're playing at uh, yeah. for one of my games. So <laughs> that's could be viewed as a bit of a downside. I sort of wonder how often uh, board game cafes get damaged copies just from spills and stuff that happen. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, next time we're at Justin's. Sticky barbecue and gooey frosting. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. He'll never let us back in again then. <laughs> he has games I need to learn how to play and try. Uh, I, I make right, my wife I'll be nice. <laughs> I make my wife keep her drinks off table. Uh she's like notorious at spilling drinks, so she she's See, there's a reason she doesn't play the with table. You. <laughs> Well, so Justin, I think I saw like there's this clip on you can get for uh, your dining room table. So like the it's a cup holder off to the side. I'll have yeah, to look up yeah. for that because that's, that's what right. you need for her. Yep. <laughs> Besides gaming at all these other wonderful places, you, there's a lot of opportunities to game on the go. Uh, whether you're vacationing or just traveling, maybe you're at the local uh, at a restaurant uh, for dinner or lunch or even a local pub. There's lots of other places that you can game at. Uh, now, almost all of these places, it's a different, probably, style of gaming than, say, a more involved, in-depth, deeper, like, say, Euro game that's going to take two or three hours or, or longer. You're probably looking at faster games, lighter, smaller, more travel-friendly games. But there's a ton of opportunities to just, hey, we're waiting for our food to arrive that we just ordered. Let's get this game that's 20 minutes to play or, or that's five minutes to play and, and play a quick game of it while we're waiting for our food to show up. Or, um, hey, we're sitting at the pub and having a drink. Or I think uh, you're stuck in an airport. There's all opportunities to have uh, a chance to play a game while you're not at home. Yeah, and I'll say... Some of my favorite games for this, when we're like going around town and everything, are those ones that come in a mint tin. Because those you can stick in your pocket or put in your purse, whatever. And so, like, the size of the game really limits what you can take with you. Or if you're flying, it's okay, you can bring a light, slightly bigger game, but you don't want your bags to be overweight. So, there's lots of possibilities, and it's a great way to use your time versus like, coloring on the tablecloth or whatever they give like kids the crayons and stuff for they don't they kind of frown at you when you're an adult and you ask for the crayons but you know it's a nice alternative to that it's not something i've leveraged a lot but i definitely i love it from the perspective of uh everybody who anybody who's ever flown somewhere knows inevitably you either have to get to the airport stupidly early and you're just duck sitting there for you know anywhere from an hour to three hours or inevitably you're traveling somewhere and you have a layover and that layover turns into two hours in some random airport and unless you have to go from one end of the airport to the other and it takes two hours you're probably going to be just sitting around doing nothing so i love it from that perspective just having something to do that keeps you going and isn't like what am i doing other than staring at the other people at the airport yeah, definitely. 
I really, you know, there's something really appealing also about the idea of somehow thematically tying in the board game you're playing with where you're visiting and having the sort of the background and the location actually feed into the board game. Like imagine playing Santorini in the city of Santorini. I mean, how cool would that be? Or, or something like, you know, you're visiting Tuscany or uh, another kind of wine making place and playing viticulture. That that's sort of there's something magic there. Yeah. We we played uh we played Reef in the Caribbean. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. That is our favorite like kind of travel game too and we uh, don't have to worry too much about the size. Yeah, that's a pretty good form to. factor for that one. So, yes. I mean obviously like you said, the tins are nice for something. I mean, you're not, I mean, I very would be shocked if anybody was going to haul Frost Haven around, but, uh, you know, they accepted, man. <laughs> Next time they take a trip to, to the Car- Caribbean, yeah. they're going to be, Hey, we're playing Frost Haven while we're down here. We had to pay extra, but the, damn it. <laughs> we're not in the pool. We're just, we're, we, we didn't not in the pool or swimming in the ocean. We're just grabbed the table somewhere and played, Frost Haven for two weeks. Probably multiple tables. We'll take up multiple tables. <laughs> so, as long as somebody keeps bringing us cocktails, we'll be fine. Frost Haven yeah. might need its own seat on the airplane, man. Pretty much. <laughs> well, we didn't. We we weren't going to bring any clothes. That was going to be the. Yeah. It was just going to qualify. I think it's a carry on. <laughs> Once or twice a day, run out in the ocean, clean up. It's all good. Yep, and then you know what? You have lots of space yourself on the plane ride back. Then, because of the you know the lack of change of clothes and real proper showers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Priorities. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> that we encourage any of that behavior. <laughs> um, so we covered uh, a lot of different places that you can play games at, whether it's at your own home or at a friend's house. Whether you choose to go to a board game con or your friendly local gaming store, of course, board game cafes, or just really anywhere you travel to, uh, all awesome opportunities for you to play those games. So let us know where you love playing games the best. We'd love to hear it. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you leave a review of this show wherever your favorite place is to find podcasts. Oh, and by the way, give us a like on our Facebook page. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest while you're at it. If you haven't looked recently, make sure you catch up on the blog at wiscodice.com. Hey, Brian, what's that site? Oh, darn. I forget. Uh, Justin, what's our website again? Wiscodice.com. That's right. It's wiscodice.com. And until next time, everyone, peace out.